my childhood. You're listening to Ruin My Childhood, the podcast where we decide if some things are better left in the past. I'm Kat. I'm Mike. And you have a problem with the way I did that intro. You changed I can it a little see bit. It in your eyes. I was surprised. I, <laughs> We're off to a great start. I was just waiting. I'm just to, shaking it up a little bit. I was just waiting to correct you on it. I know. <laughs> I could see it in your eyes as soon as I said it. Oh, man. Wow. Our relationship is great. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a really good place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what are we covering today? We are covering the classic 90s film starring <laughs> Freddie Prince Jr., Rachel Lee Cook, Usher, Lil' Kim. And a bunch of other people. We're covering She's All That. She's All That. Yep. Kiss me. (laughs) It's interesting how a movie that I remember being somewhat mediocre has an iconic scene like that. It has Everyone several knows iconic scenes. Scene. I can't. <laughs> um, it has several iconic scenes. Uh, there's the the hacky sack scene as well. The hacky sack and the um, hacky sack. Don't let it drop. <laughs> and then there's the um, the Rockefeller skink dance, uh, the Fat Boy Slim song. A uh, Rockefeller skink dance. What is that? So you know that song. Check it out. I now. know exactly. Who yeah, Fat Boy at the Slim end is. of the movie, they have like a whole choreographed dance number to that song. Oh dear. Yeah. What year did this come out? 99, I think. Yes, it was 99. I'm the pretty sure new I was in millennium. I was one of those annoying kids who would uh, inform <laughs> everyone whenever they said, it's, it's the end of the millennium. We're starting like, a new no, millennium. No, it's not until like, 2001. Yeah, I was that kid. <laughs> I was that kid. And there were so many times our close family friends, I spent that last Thanksgiving with them in their mom's house, and she was selling the house in. Uh, Sacramento and someone was like oh it's the last Thanksgiving of the millennium in this house and I I could just see Ellen look at me like don't say anything (laughs) (laughs) that was annoying so still am what what else do you remember about this movie um basically it's uh Pygmalion oh (laughs) not really not really it has undertones of Pygmalion it's uh uh, you know the typical you make a girl over who is already gorgeous uh you take her hair down and take off her glasses and she's stunning mm. she can achieve greatness so i remember more like the culture around this movie so i remember this movie came out when i was in fifth grade and in fifth grade we went from having like in fourth grade and below you have like the desk that you, it's just kind of like a slot that you put stuff in but once you got to like fifth grade you had a desk that like lifted up to put your stuff in and i remember all the girls in my class had freddie prince jr photos in their desk uh, all the girls love freddie prince jr he's um he's got a strange pallor kind of looks like a vampire right yeah, honestly like uh he's naturally a little bit darker he kind of reminds me bleaches. of jasper from Twilight. Oh, yeah. He has a similar mouth, like a weird yeah. the way he like holds he his jaw. He always looks like he's in pain. Yeah, a little bit. Like he needs to drink like a some fish. blood. A fish. I, I think he kind of looks fishy or lizardy, like reptilian maybe. I had a really good joke and you talked over me. I'm right sorry. <laughs> Deliver said joke. Never mind, you ruined it. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I just remember it being a typical teen movie as we're so popular around this era. Right. There were quite a few of them. Um, created the thirty-year-olds playing teenagers norm that existed in Hollywood for quite some time. I mean, that goes back to like the seventies, though. Like, yeah. But yeah, no, they definitely none of them looked like they were in high school. I, they as far as I remember, try with no. This movie. Not I mean, they didn't. Until, honestly, it's not until the last like five, ten years that people have started getting like younger looking. Like we have like Tom Holland and Spider Man. Right. He looks young. He looks like he could be a high school, but that's that's a fairly new new thing. We have some comments from listeners on what they remember about it. This one was really popular. Like within minutes of me posting, you know, this on social media, I got like five, six comments within minutes. So we got a lot of people who have fond memories of this movie. So yeah. I'm actually really excited to watch it because I don't rem- have fond memories of this movie. I remember I feel like we watched it within the last 10 years and I don't remember it being good. But a lot of people have fond memories, so I'm really really excited to watch it. But let's read some of these comments. 
uh, Wreck My Podcast said, never seen it, but seen not another teen movie a bunch, dot, dot, dot. Pretty much the same thing, right? Sweating, smiling emoji. So that movie, they actually, as far as I know, they actually filmed it in the same school and they had a lot of dialogue that was like line for line the same, but they just read it differently. Chris Evans is in that movie. It's pretty great. <laughs> it's actually a terrible movie. Uh, I've got Monica Minor that says, ha, 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 my favorite <laughs> Freddy movie. Because I was obsessed with him when I was younger, lol. When she was younger. Actually, what has he even done? Freddie Prince Jr., he went on to do like Scooby-Doo, Wing Commander, and then he is now like a voice in like Star Wars cartoons. Good for him. Still working. Gotta get that grind. Banging Sarah Michelle Gellar. I mean, they're married, but... Yeah. So, I mean, they're banging. Now they bang all the time. <laughs> Shauna Slay says that classic dance scene in her backyard with Kiss Me playing, the scene where she walks down the stairs for the big reveal of her makeover, and she basically just cut her hair and put on a dress. So relatable. And can't forget Freddie Prince Jr. doing that weird interpretive dance slash poetry thing. Not sure it gets better, TBH. Nice. And Nikki Britton said, I just watched this with my little sister the other day. I couldn't help but get annoyed when they acted like she was so awkward and unattractive. Dot, dot, dot. She was just an art student basically. i've got some stuff to say on that but we'll we'll wait until we watch the movie and see how it actually plays out ty customs and fig said the poems and ball games soccer games it's a soccer ball soccer ball games <laughs> <laughs> all right um I, th I think that's all the the relevant ones that i have yes <laughs> that's about it yeah so i think we should go watch the movie sure Kiss me, <laughs> buy me. Are you done? Yeah. Kiss me out of the bearded barley nightly. All right, that was actually a lot better than i expected yeah um i i i actually really really enjoyed it and i actually have a bunch of trivia for this one that I, I actually thought was pretty interesting all right let's have it so the premise of this movie i think we should summarize it and then i'll get to the to the trivia you but do that summary so nutshell really easy uh freddie prince jr plays zach he is the prom king gonna be the prom king he's vice or he's like class president he's the jock he's everybody wants to be him all the girls like him to the point where he miss like he calls a girl a completely different name she's like he knows my name and they're like that's not your name kind of thing so everybody loves him and he gets dumped by his girlfriend just a few weeks before prom so he makes a bet with paul walker that he can take any girl in the school school and make her prom queen just by dating her and that's basically what the movie is he finds uh, Rachel Lee Cook, who plays Janie, who's, you know, ugly, Laney. Laney, who's ugly and, you know, weird. And he's like, no, I can't, not her, pick anybody else. But then eventually, you know, he falls for her. And, you know, that's the movie, a little, little teen rom-com. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, a couple of things that are interesting about this movie. So for, for years, it was rumored that M. Night Shyamalan of Sixth Sense fame actually wrote this movie and then it came out that he didn't write the movie and he denied it for a long time and then about five six years ago he admitted to it and he actually said that he ghost wrote the movie that he actually wrote the whole movie the whole movie that's what he says then why would he not claim that when it was successful um uh, so that's the thing that's really interesting about this movie is this Did movie you think it would ruin his creepy cred well this was before this movie came out before the sixth sense of course maybe so, he was waiting for that maybe the other thing is this movie is actually also credited for ruining Miramax, like their oh. reputation. So what ended up happening is it turns out he didn't write the whole movie. What happened was, the, and the guy who actually wrote the movie, I don't remember his name, got pissed when M. Night Shyamalan said that he wrote the movie. So what happened is some other guy wrote the movie. The movie wasn't going to get greenlit. So then they brought in M. Night Shyamalan to kind of punch it up. And then once he did his little like touch-ups... Is he a punch it up kind of writer? He was. He that's he used to be. So he punched it up, and he's he's actually responsible for the hacky sack. 
Oh, boy. Heck, he sec. That was one of his contributions. Oh, that smells like him. And then once they added that and the movie got greenlit, then the original writer went through and kind of made it fit the rest of the tone of the movie. Got it. So he has a major part to do with the movie, but he he didn't actually write the movie, according to the director and the original writer. Just being a bit of a turd about it. Right. I see how it is. But yeah, this movie has an interesting history. I'll sprinkle some stuff in as we go. Got it. Um, so the movie starts out with that whole scenario where he gets dumped, he needs to find a subject, and the guys point Lainey out. She's just tripped at the top of the stairs right. and she's wearing coveralls because she's coming from art class. You know, it's sensible. You don't wear your good clothes. Well, she wore coveralls the whole movie until she got her makeover. Yeah, but she was painting the whole time. That's true. She's not dressing for no man. <laughs> she's wearing her coveralls, going about her business, getting an education, as you should be in high school. And this Letterman jacket wearing bro and his fellow bros are like, ew, she's gross. Let's pick her. Right. And really, she's not gross. Like, okay, here's the thing about high school. Girls can wear the dumpiest. You didn't go to high school. You don't know anything about high school. I know high schoolers. You can wear the you know dumpiest. The best words dumpiest grossest clothes and a dude will still be trying to check out what's going on underneath those clothes guys are aware of like what your body's like i agree she wasn't wearing like super baggy clothes either like i think guys just see a hot chick they know she's hot and they're looking for the hotness um i agree and disagree but so. if she's it's not like she was super weird. She was artistic, but she wasn't a weird right. high school. And I, I agree she that they creepy. could have done more to, like, they could have had, like, a weird family thing, like, where maybe the dad had some, like, a shady past and people had, like, she had a bad reputation because of her family. Like, they could have done more where it's not just she's unattractive, but she has a weird family history. Or maybe she punched somebody. Or maybe they do, like, 10 Things I Hate About well, You where that character did that because, like, the community sort of looks down on him like oh your dad cleans our pool but it was just a few a few students the that rich did that. kids right the rich kids yeah. did that so i feel like they could have done more or everything or you know uh one of the colkins i think it was kieran colkin mm -hmm. played her younger brother and he has hearing aids but they never really bring anything up with it you just see him wearing it. like maybe right. maybe if they made him like autistic or something it was like and, a throwaway detail that right. didn't come into play so if maybe if they made something with him like he was emotionally stunted or whatever and she had to deal with him and you know something to make it a little bit more obvious that she's an right. outsider but for the most part she's just kind of artistic she's raging against the machine she's making her art and trying to find her place in the world right and the the now where i disagree with you is your statement that guys would still be attracted to her if she just has a hot no, body. No, they would still see the potential. Whereas when they pick her out, they're like, uh, no way, that's so impossible. I, I can see that because specifically, I'm not going to name any names, but when I was in, you know, elementary, middle school, high school, you know, I went through from third grade through high school with basically the same people. And there were girls that were very pretty and very attractive that guys did stay away because, you know, either they were like super, super Christian or for whatever reason, they were just a little weird or off. There Caroline. were. I don't want to throw names out, but um, <laughs> she's my friend. Um, but there were a few. There were there were girls that I there, there, I remember there was a girl specifically that I thought was really cute from like sixth seventh grade on, and nobody thought everybody thought it was weird that I thought she was cute until senior year. Then all of a sudden, everyone thought she was hot because she started. I don't know if she had worked with somebody, but she ended up becoming friends with one of the quote unquote popular people. And then all of a sudden, everyone thought she was super hot. Huh. So I definitely think there is a status thing that will make you. It's just like I think we've talked about on other episodes with things where it's like if there's a kid who's like constantly getting picked on, even the kids who aren't bullies aren't going to hang out with this kid because they don't want to be guilty right. by association. So I think there is something to that. I guess. I feel like in high school, though, teenage boys are horny enough that they're willing to look past that for the no, most part. No, they're not. They're not? No. Wow. No, there are, there are, there would be girls that you would not go around, even if you thought they were cute, just because they have that reputation. That's pathetic. It is. It's sad, but, it, you know, kids are, kids are cruel. Right. And, and this character, I mean, it's interesting that he... Well, the, the film is split, so there are basically two protagonists, and one of them is this Zack dude. And he's not likable. It's strange I, that so much of the story revolves around his journey because 
he has so many opportunities to do the right thing, and he still allows the people around him to be total jerks. So there's there's a re- so it's actually pretty interesting. There's a reason why they did that in the movie. So originally, they didn't. It wasn't going to be Freddie Prince Jr. They didn't know who they were going to get, but uh, Harvey Weinstein actually really put. So mm-hmm. Miramax was run by the Weinstein brothers before they split and made the Weinstein Company. So earlier I mentioned that this movie kind of like shattered the image of miramax so miramax used to be predominantly independent films or pick up independent films and then distribute them so this movie is one that they actually developed from the beginning to be a commercial success so like this was like their first kind of just like not art or dramatic movie but just like popcorn flick kind of movie so a lot of people actually looked down on miramax when they made this movie and called it like the beginning of the end whatever right so it was actually Harvey Weinstein that really wanted Freddie Prince Jr. And he pushed and pushed the director to get him. So once they got him and they felt that Freddie Prince Jr. was really likable, they decided they needed to add more story elements because they wanted him to have some relatability. So that's when they added the parts of him hiding all of his acceptance letters to all the Ivy League schools and the whole like thing that he doesn't want to live in his father's shadow kind of thing. So they did try to add some stuff to make him not like just the perfect dude. So that's kind of like where how that story element came to. He came still about. seems like a jerk though, despite all that. I, I, I would agree with you if he if it was one of like the generic like rom com things where they don't real he doesn't realize he likes her until the very end of the movie when he loses her. But I feel like he started to like her almost right away, like when he saw her doing that weird performance art mm-hmm. with like the dwar- the little people in, in the garbage cans and she was wearing like white makeup. I think he was into her almost that first time that he saw her outside of school. I think that get, redeems him a little bit. It's still pretty terrible. The whole thing is him deceiving her and pretending right. that he's interested in her when he's not. And it's all for a bet. I don't think he was that pretending. That makes him irredeemably oh, no. he's a jerk. awful. And you know what's, what's really interesting about this movie? So the whole premise of this movie is super chauvinistic and... Mm-hmm sexist and all that stuff this movie actually passes the the um, is it the blydell test oh what <laughs> yeah. yeah um it actually does um it's obviously not a feminist movie but it does pass because you know there are several scenes where specifically uh laney is talking to other girls that are named and they're not talking about a guy so the beginning of the movie the actual opening scene is she's doing like her art Mm-hmm. and the teacher's like oh you know what does it mean to you like it's dark and it's technically proficient but what does it mean so the two girls come up they're like oh it's so dark maybe you should kill yourself so your art will be worth something like it's super dark yeah. and then at the party scene she's help cleaning up the same girl who says she should kill herself like vomit and she's like oh look at me i'm rich and you're poor and you're cleaning up my puke how does it feel kind of thing so they're actually like, it actually does pass the test considering how right. sexist the movie is another thing i don't like about the character is his main motivation is that he is um he's spurned by yeah. his girlfriend and it's not he's enough- an incel basically <laughs> it's not enough for him to just roll with the punches and cut his losses and be like okay you know i'll just find i'll find the hottest girl in the school to take with me to prom if i can't take her instead he needs to dethrone her he does well, this specifically to take her down that was the whole motivation that and then also gross. paul walker and Dula hills characters really kind of like egged him on right to do it and like you know peer pressure is a thing especially when you're in that you know he's the alpha male like you need to have that reputation and it's sad but like you can tell that he was conflicted i feel like almost like i said earlier almost right away he feels conflicted about it and he even there are some things that he says that are not okay like when he he basically stalks her Mm -hmm. and then when he finally like he shows up at her house with like the jv soccer team and has them clean the house because she made the excuse that she needs to clean so she can't go out brings her address and everything and then he keeps telling her to like smile throughout the movie yeah so you know it's definitely problematic but i do think but they make it clear that he's a jerk like the first time we meet the character he's walking into the school at the beginning of the day and he stops to look at a picture of himself that's right yeah that's (laughs) really bad yeah he smiles at it his like picture of the being class president He's just kind of a gross guy. Yeah, he, but he's just like a high school kid. And like by the, he has an arc and he is I do think he is redeemed by the end of the well, sort of. I think I'd say he's mostly redeemed by the end of the movie, but he's really he's a very immature person. Speaking of immature, 
she uh, Lainey works at a falafel hut. Right. <laughs> and this guy walks in. He's a character kind of actor. And he's ordering. And he says, supersize my balls. And we both laughed at it. <laughs> Well, that joke went on for a long time because he kept saying, like, what does super size mean? Like, how big are the super size balls? And the, so the, the joke kind of goes on for a little bit. Uh, Simple humor. Right. And, you know, appealing to the lowest common denominator. Pretty much. You know what character I really liked in the movie? Hmm. Matthew Lillard's character. I love his character, but he reminds us of your cousin. I, so he looks like. My cousin Stephen, who unfortunately passed away almost two th- like six, seven years ago, he looks like a skinny version of my cousin. And more than that, 2011, babe. Oh, was it that long ago? Wow. Um, but his mannerisms, the way he acts. Yeah. Now, this character is a little bit more aloof and a little bit more like he's a little bit of a jerk. Because my cousin wasn't a jerk. He was a great guy. But the way he just like starts dancing in the middle of the part, like that's my jam. My cousin did that so many times and some of the jokes he made and the weird like checking himself out in the mirror and doing little like moving his hands over across his eyebrows like it was it was really weird because it was like seeing my cousin again it was a good character too yeah he's just a fun character i mean everything that matthew lillard does is good they i were... haven't really seen a bad performance no, from him he, um and he was in he's been like... in bad movies but he's never right. been bad and he he did a lot of freddie prince jr movies so they they were together in a lot of movies so they did this wing commander uh, the Scooby Doo movies, and then like some other rom com. Like they were like they were like a duo for he's a while. He's an extremely versatile actor too. I agree. Like at Thirteen Ghosts, everything he's really good. I I I've always liked him. It's kind of bumps me out that I don't. I haven't seen him in anything in a long time. I think he's just kind of doing more stuff across the pond. Is he not American? I don't think he was. I'm pretty sure he is. Is he? He was an SLC punk. I saw him in a lot of British stuff. Oh, maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> uh the oh you know what i actually thought was really interesting about this movie now that we start talking about that character there are a couple of scenes where it, they're kind of like this they go into memories and then have, have like weird fantasy elements so like the beginning of the movie when freddie prince jr's character zach's girlfriend breaks up with him he's like you owe me an explanation like what's going on like we just got back from spring break and you're you have a tattoo and you're breaking up with me what happens so she goes and says like how she went on spring break and she got to be on TV and she got, almost fell in the pool. And then she meets Matthew Lillard's character, who is a real world um, contestant right? right? and everything. Right. But during that whole scene where you see it as a flashback, Freddie Prince Jr.'s character and the girlfriend are walking around the scene talking about what's going on. So it's kind of like this weird fantasy flashback in them interacting with the memory. And then later on at when uh, Zach is feeling conflicted about the whole arrangement he has this like fantasy that they're on the real world and all the people are in there and it's, it switches to like really kind of crappy TV camera mode. They do some fun things like that. Yeah. Like the way that they shot the spring break scene, yeah. I really like. It looked like the MTV shows at yeah. that time. But I, I like the way they shot that in that she was telling the story of how she met this guy. Okay, so the queen bee of the school. We should do Taylor. Little, Taylor. Taylor Vaughn is explaining to Freddie Prince Jr., pretty much while they're breaking up, how she met this guy at spring break. And she's narrating it, but she's also in the scene. And he's kind of stumbling through the scene with her, but he's wearing the clothes that he's wearing during the conversation at their high school, but he's in Cancun or whatever, right. in the swimming party. So it's kind of fun. I like how they played with that a little bit, but that was pretty much the only time that they did that. And then the real world fantasy right. as well. Uh, the other thing that I thought was... What I liked about that, and it comes back, is so she comes and goes, oh, did you really think that we? I was going to go off to college still dating you? Yes. Oh, you did. That's oh. so sweet. And then later on, uh, Matthew Lillard's character breaks up with her, and he goes, did you really think I was going to leave for the real world all-star still dating you? Oh, you did. <laughs> That's so, so sweet. sweet. <laughs> you know, I, I like, it's, it's the classic kind of like using the bad guy's words against them. Yeah. I love when that happens. Uh. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. Um, oh, man. This movie had a lot of random little, well, just random actors in it. Uh, Sarah Michelle Gellar shows up randomly in a cafeteria, doesn't have a line. She's just eating there, right? Um, Do you know why? No. So th- I don't know if they were dating yet. So Freddie Prince Jr. and Sarah Michelle Gellar obviously are married. 
The previous year they were in I Know What You Did Last Summer, but the high school that they filmed this movie in, it's the same high school they used for uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh. Um, Usher's in this. Random. Usher. Lil' Kim. Lil' Kim. Oh, Lil' Kim's original you wanna, face. You want to hear something interesting? So a lot of people say this movie is racist. Why? So... It's interesting because this movie has a diverse cast. Like, you have Dulé Hill, you have Lil' Kim, you have Usher. Um, there's that scene towards the middle of the movie when... Surprisingly, Dulé Hill is not stomping around tap dancing. <laughs> Does he tap dance in anything? Yes. Well, I don't know if he tap dances in something, but if you're on set with him, he's, like, tap dancing oh. aggressively. Is he good? He is passionate. <laughs> he's a passionate <laughs> tap dancer. <laughs> Um, it's a lot of stomping. <laughs> he stomps the yard? I guess. So, uh, retroactively, in the last few years, people kind of started to say this movie is racist. Even though it has, like, the super diverse cast, there's a scene later on where you see, you know, some students, like, rapping, doing, like, a rap battle, pretending to be Laney and Taylor kind of thing. But none of the the black characters have last names, and a lot of them don't have um names that also like usher is just credited as school dj um dule hill is just preston but like all the other like all the white characters have last names credited Aww. little kim is just alex and then at the beginning of the movie there's that scene where freddie prince jr is like oh hey melissa and then she's like she know he knows my name and then the girl there's a girl that goes your name's connie and that girl so it's connie is in the credits does but- connie have a last name it's, I think it might just be Connie, but the girl who says he didn't know your name, he called you the wrong name, she's black, and she's credited as, like, student number two. Yeah, but that's just how you credit films, unless the name is indicated Unless it's somewhere. actually said out loud. Yeah. So that's the thing that's a little weird. So, like, Paul Walker's character... That's I, a bit of a reach. It, it is a bit of a reach. It is interesting that, you know, Preston doesn't have a last name, because, you know, they do give last names to, like, Paul Walker's but character But he doesn't and Taylor. play as much as Paul Walker's character. He doesn't. Like, he's in almost every scene that Paul, Paul Walker's, Walker's in. Paul Walker's character has a little subplot. He does. Um, so I think it, I agree that it's a bit of a stretch, but it is interesting, you know... To see that that is the case. And, you know, there is an issue in Hollywood where, you know, there aren't that many roles. And, but I Absolutely. do have to give credit that, you know, this cast is, it, it is diverse, whether or not they had meaty roles or a lot of lines. Gabrielle Union's in this movie, and this is, I think, I don't know if this is pre or post Bring It On. Does it matter? She looks exactly the she same looks the now. She looks the same, yeah. Um, but yeah, some people have a little bit of criticism for that eh. aspect. I think it is a bit of a stretch, bit I agree. But, you know, I figured I'd bring it up. Um, oh my gosh. There's just so much BS in this movie, unfortunately. So, one thing that is not BS is when Zach goes to see Lainey's performance art, Mm -hmm. it is exactly like high school and college arts scenes. Pretentious and weird. Exactly, yeah. Uh, Pretentious, weird, bizarre, um... You know, right on point with that. But what pisses me off is, like, they have this whole performance that, you know, the event was set up for. Right. He gets dragged up onto stage, and he has nothing to do, so he does this hacky sack thing. And he gets this big, huge applause. Like, it's this... It wasn't, people it's are a all standing blown ovation. away by it compared to the actual performance no, they clapped, that they were there for. they clapped way more for that. Like, they were not as enthusiastic. No, they were. I would, I would tell you to rewatch it. I don't think they were. Okay. I... I and, and Lainey, like, he feels great about it, and he's like, that was weird, right? And she's like, tries to be nice, and she, eventually she's like, yeah, that was weird. I actually thought it was, when you look at the character's arc over the whole movie, and you find out that he actually has, like, this identity issue with he's doing everything for everybody else, and he doesn't do what he wants to do, that whole scene actually does make a ton of sense, because it's all like, can't let it drop. Zach, everyone's watching you. Everyone's depending on you. It does make sense. And everything. I actually think in the context of the movie, I actually don't think it's a stupid scene. I think it's actually... I think it plays pretty well in retrospect. I, I remember... I think it makes sense, but it's a bummer from Lainey's perspective that she put all this time and effort into a performance. Right. And he got just as much applause, and he made it up on the spot. Right. But, you know, maybe he's a true artist. Oh. <laughs> gross. Uh, I have this note in here that says... It's autocorrect. Rachel Lee Cook's lube delivery is painful. It's supposed <laughs> to be line. Line delivery. Yeah, she wasn't very good. 
Yeah, unfortunately. So not. one of the things that people said. So I think one of our our fans said that you know she got a haircut and took the glasses off, and then somebody else just said, "Oh, they take her glasses off and she's beautiful." And that is a cri- like a criticism of this movie, and it has been for a long time. I do think they did a little bit more than just take her glasses off. Like they cut off like a foot of hair plucked her eye gave her they had she had a unibrow that they got rid of um (laughs) a cute little unibrow she was cute i'm not gonna say like a lot like another little trivia thing i said that the the crew and the director and the writer were like you just have to accept that you know she's beautiful i don't think i wouldn't say she's beautiful she's very cute she's a very cute girl um but i think a few years later i think uh a princess diaries did the whole like ugly girl turns cute a little bit better because anne hathaway is obviously beautiful um but they gave her like really curly hair huge mono mono brow unibrow unibrow, that's like the british way of saying it really curly hair (laughs) really curly thick hair men says on podcast with his wife who has really curly hair yeah but they (laughs) then they know it's totally a thing right 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 it's I like it's your curly hair. I think you look residual racism. I think you look better not. with your curly hair. Than I do look better with my curly hair because curly hair is superior. But we're so hung up on being now. I think less Hathaway, ethnic, less black, less I Jewish, agree. and we don't even realize we're doing it anymore. So we think we're supposed to have soft, silky, smooth hair. That good hair. That good hair. I do think Anne Hathaway looked better with the straight hair than the curly hair. Well, because they frizzed it out, Michael. <laughs> that is not properly cared for curly hair. Got it. Ugh. So. This movie, it it goes pretty quick. Like, I thought there was more him courting her. Like, he kind of wears her down and gets her. down to, fast. Yeah, gets her to the beach. And then Paul Walker somehow finds out she's going to the beach. They're going to the beach and brings the whole crew. And, you know, they have an okay day until. Hold up. They see her emerge from her cocoon of baggy clothing like, in oh, that's right. a one-piece swimsuit. And they're like, check out the bobos on that one right bobos why do these movies always seem to make up ridiculous phrases for teenage boys to call boobs i don't know never maybe knockers that's even a bit of a stretch tiggle bitties or tits tits. tits. or boobs Boobs. or just boobs yeah boobs but yeah uh, bobos no one says that no um i think it was uh we did it last year but um hocus pocus Pocus called it like wabos or something like that why yeah i don't know no uh but yeah you know they do that one scene and then she gets upset with somebody and then decides that it was a mistake to come out and freddie prince jr's character was like hey you had fun look you're smiling kind of thing and then he goes to her house and they have a party and then the girl taylor like spills wine or something on her and she's like thank you i realize why i'm not supposed to be at places like this i've been avoiding it and then all of a sudden it's on. She's nominated for prom queen. She's not. He's nominated for prom queen, and they don't really interact. He's much. nominated for prom or queen. prom king, and then they don't really interact much. <laughs> and then they face off. <laughs> <laughs> but then they don't interact very much at that point because Taylor is trying to get back with with Zach, and then Paul Walker starts to basically he tells Lainey about the bet, and then he tries to act all sensitive, right, and gets her to go to prom. And well, he's trying to bang her. He's trying to bang her. But he's acting all sweet and sensitive. Like, he shows up at her house, and she thinks that Freddie Prince Jr. is coming, and it's actually Paul Walker. And he goes, I didn't ask anybody to the prom just in case you agreed to go with me tonight. You don't even have to put on a dress if you don't want to. And, you know, I think he actually did a pretty convinc- pretty good job of playing the douchebag, but then also pretending to be sensitive. Like, Right. I thought he did a pretty good job for that. That's probably the best Paul Walker performance I've ever seen. Yeah, it was. Because Paul Walker's not very good wasn't very yeah oh. you guys can listen to my paul walker <laughs> rant on a re- remake rewind okay, on one you of know just episodes, because but, someone's dead doesn't mean we have to elevate them beyond what they were i think there's like a biopic or a documentary coming out about him pretty soon anyway yeah um yeah he's dead that's very sad moving on r.i.p paul walker r.i.p lil kim's original face <laughs> i think it's time to put this film to bed um i just want to talk about the dance scene oh god so they show up to prom and they have a a throwaway line where usher's like hey do that, that do that dance that i taught you guys <laughs> i know you've been practicing i know you've been practicing and then they do like a choreographed dance see, too. every single character is equally invested in this dance which is 
absolute bs so the thing that's weird about it is so you see everybody kind of doing it but then when it does like wide shots you see clearly professional dancers right and everything's like you don't see any of the main characters actually doing the dance <laughs> except for like close-ups they didn't uh, have time for rehearsal no well there's a reason for that why they needed to pad the runtime of the movie so they added that scene at the last minute <laughs> that's terrible yeah it wasn't in the script <laughs> Oh, so man. they they needed to add like three minutes to the runtime. So that's they, ridiculous. They that never that happens. Dance. So <laughs> yeah, that's what they did that for. Uh, and then you know they he shows up to her house after the prom and they have their little like dance outside by her pool and kind of thing. And you know there was a lot of other little things like we didn't really touch on Zach becoming friends with her little brother. I actually really liked that relationship. Yeah, that was kind of nice. So throughout the movie. Obviously, he's the big man on campus, and her little brother, um, played by Karen Culkin, like idolizes this guy, and he does the same thing. He's like, "Hey, Johnny, I don't. I'm just gonna throw out a name," and he's like, "He knows my name." She's like, "Shut up, loser. That's not your name." Mm. But he uses he kind of uses the brother to get her to go to the beach. So he shows up, like, "Hey, let's go to the beach," and the she's like, "No." And the little brother's like, "You want to come in and play Sega?" Then he's like, "Yeah, I'll stay and play Sega then," <laughs> and that's why she agrees to go. But he ends up, like, defending her, the kid from the bullies. Like, these kids put pubes on his pizza, and he makes the bullies eat the pube pizza. Pube pizza. And then, like, he's actually has, like, a little secret handshake. Like, he actually seems to really like this kid, and the kid is, like, idolizing him. And then what I actually really liked is once you found out about the bet, Freddie Prince Jr. keeps calling the house, and the kid picks up, and he's like, shut up, asshole, kind of <laughs> thing. And... And that that kid was clearly hurt. Like it's not just that he hurt his sister. Yeah. His sister, he was hurt by the whole relationship as well. Fraud. And so I actually really liked that subplot it was quite a bit. Nice. Kind of nice. Yeah, totally. Um, one thing that seems to kind of play as sort of just a side note is Lainey at the beginning. Um, <laughs> she does this art piece in her class, and her art teacher is like. Yeah, that's great, but where are you in there? Like, right. just totally dismissive of her. At the end, she finally creates a piece that, you know, speaks to who she is and what she's going through in her journey. And, it you know, it was just kind of thrown away. It right. gets buried in the film. Yeah, because she just shows up at prom and is like, hey, by the way, your final project is great. And it's just like a picture of her mom with like a blue frame around it. But, yeah, she made a bunch of ugly collages. Right. That's about it. Uh, the, the thing that kind of bothered me at the end of the movie is one of the other subplots, and they don't spend a ton of time on it, is Freddie Prince Jr. got into every Ivy League school, right? That would have been really expensive right. to apply to all those. Yeah, but I mean, clearly his family has money. Like, the house that he has was huge. And his dad comes in, and he's like, you're past the deadline all that. He's like, you're throwing away your future. And he's like, you want this for me. I don't know what I want. And the dad's like, I don't care what you I, I don't care about me. You do what you want to do. So there's this whole like fake thing where he just is convinced that his dad is wants to control his life and it's like thrown away by one line. So at the end of the movie, he's it was like, all just a misunderstanding. Right, it's all just a misunderstanding. <laughs> so at the end of the movie, he's like kissing Rachel Lee Cook and you know she's like, so what are we gonna do? And he goes, I'm gonna go to art school. And it's like, uh, you haven't done any art yet. Maybe take some extracurriculars. Right. He has no portfolio. He has done no art his entire high school career. No school would accept him. I did like the other kind of thing where she thought... So she was very suspicious of him the entire movie. And she thought that, oh, I'm a nerd, so he wants me to tutor. And he's like, I've got the fourth highest GPA in the school kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I did like that. I did think they had some good chemistry. Yeah, they did. Surprisingly. Uh, but yeah, I I'm, I actually had fun with the movie. It's interesting. It's simple. It's not a complex film. I don't know if it's a good film, but it's entertaining. It, it does its job. It had an F bomb. It did. I have did an appreciate F -bomb. that. Yeah. Um, PG thirteen got its one, and yeah. they actually used it. Good for them. <laughs> so ruined your childhood. Nah. No. No, it's a good I, one. I I liked this a lot more than I thought I was going to. Yeah, it's, I did too. It's definitely a watchable, entertaining it's film. It's fun. I, I don't think I would just watch this on our own, but if if we had friends over and we were having like a party or something, someone wanted to throw in a movie, I think this is a good movie to watch with like <laughs> people our age, like kind of thing, like not like a cocktail party, but you right. know, this this is, a, there's some good laughs in it. I, I enjoyed it. Good one. Um, So what are we covering next time? I'm pulling a U. I forgot. Big. Oh, we're going to cover big. 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 
big. I love Tom Hanks. I love yeah, breaking news. Another woman has come forward and accused Tom Hanks of being nice. <clears throat> um, <laughs> this movie is a Penny Marshall film, right? I don't know. Is it? I'm pretty sure it is. It is a Penny Marshall film. It is a Penny Marshall film. Good job. I figured we should do a little homage to yeah, one of the... Yeah, that's a good idea. One of the heavyweights in the industry paving the way for other women. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, uh, Katrina, mm -hmm. love of my life. Mm -hmm. Beautiful woman. Mm -hmm. Pretty girl. Mm -hmm. Smart, intelligent, strong, independent mm -hmm. woman. Strong. Like bull. Strong like bull. Where can our listeners and followers find you? I'm all over the internet at Katridocity. Check out her YouTube. Yeah. And uh, check out everything that's MDX Pods related at MDXPods.com. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook at MDX Pods. Check out our other podcasts, Remake, Rewind. And uh, of course, check out our Patreon. If you want to support the show, go to patreon.com slash MDX Pods. Throw in a buck or two, whatever you can spare. It really helps the show. And uh, that's it. Thanks for listening. Thanks.